All right, awesome. We're going to go ahead and start with the program counter today. Um, and this is solid because previously we already went over the read-only memory and how we were going to write down and store our program. But now we're going to move a little bit further along that track um, and kind of get a, a little bit, you know, a little bit of an easier aspect of the project done as well. Um, but nevertheless, very helpful and very important, right? So let's work through this. Um, some announcements and background. We have kind of, you know, we're going to, um, again, the numbers are a little bit off, but we're going to kind of get through these next um, few chunks here. Um, announcements. Doo -doo -doo. That is old stuff. Introduction. Now we've kind of gone over this stuff already, but I'll just kind of uh, get us back into it. As you recall last week, we've built the ALU, right? Now we need a few more things to take this from just a calculator circuit to an actual computer. Previously, on CMSC 389E, we worked through ways to store the programs and ways to um, sort of interpret these programs, right? How to um, iterate through our structure of stored programs and pull out um, specific lines based on what line we wanted, right? So given a number in binary, we were able to reliably pull out um, a quote unquote, like a program, right? Um, a line of code for that line number in binary. So if we were to ask for line zero, we'd get a certain um, set of assembly instructions. If we were to ask for line one, we get another set of assembly instructions uh, and so on and so forth. So that's what we worked through last time with the help of read only memory. And now we're kind of going to build on top of that. Um, in the sense that we are going to work on a program counter, right? Now we've already figured out ways to, again, store and interpret these programs. Now we need a way to execute such programs, right? So here's a little bit of background first and foremost. Let's take a look at the system that we have already produced. So, so far, right, what we've actually worked out that we want to be doing is, um, here and again here's a little black boxed version of what we just worked through we request a particular line right that goes into our circuit right and let's say this is the actual line of code uh, represented with a, a few redstone torches and blocks um then we do some decoder magic given that you know that set of redstone blocks and on the wires that we have as output for our circuit this output comes out right so again we request a particular line of code um and our circuit says okay well you wanted this line here are the signals coming out um that are reflecting this line of code right and our decoder will of course provide these signals um for us to work with so that's what we've worked through so far now again or actually, that's what I wanted to um, kind of emphasize here. We want to worry about this bit here, the part where we request a line, right? So we've already talked about what happens um, when we request a particular line, right? You get code um, that reflects what was stored at that line. However, we have no way of right now determining what line to request, right? And it would be excellent for us to know, um, obviously, you want to request line zero first, Right, execute that, then you want to request line one, execute that, and you might think that's a little simple. You might say, okay, well, why don't we just, you know, add one over and over? Um, you know, you're kind of basically there, uh, but there are a few more nuances that we have to consider, right? And I implore you to kind of think about how an actual interpreter would go through assembly that way, right? Because it doesn't just go from top to bottom. Remember, we have sometimes we have the jump and link statements, right? Where we skip a few lines, sometimes we go back. Um, so that's where it gets a little interesting, and that's what we're kind of going to talk about today. So here's the deal. We already know that we need a way to request lines. And we already have that. We know reliably that if we know the binary number for the line we want, the circuit that we've built can provide us with a line at that binary number. So that's good. We also, I mean, exactly. Um, we want to make sure that we know why this is exactly. Um, so if anybody has any questions about this, you know, feel free to ask. Um, but this is kind of the, the precursor to what we're going to be talking about today. That is, let's think about this. Let's think about the order 
in which we need to request these, right? After all, after requesting one line, we're going to need a way to request the next, then the next after that, then the next after that, etc., right? So you might already be thinking about what sort of circuits would be optimal for this sort of thing. But again, right, think about it this way. We need we need line number zero, then we need line number one, um, and so on and so forth. And again, you may have one you may be wondering, okay, how do we keep track of something like this? Well the answer is we need a way to keep track of the current um the current program counter or the current line that we're at, right? And this again might help us help us draw some um analogies between um assembly and this, because in assembly itself, there is a particular program counter register um, that you can always access, and it'll tell you exactly what line you're at, right? Um, and it's the same business here. Again, to make R's work, we're going to be using a little bit of sequential logic, which we talked about um, a little bit earlier. No worries, I, I find this to be, I think this is like a, a pretty intuitive example of sequential logic, and hopefully this should, this should make a lot of sense as we move forward. So, just wanted to add that we aren't just thinking of moving one by one, right? It's not as simple as saying, okay, zero plus one is one, one plus one is two, two plus one is three. You don't just move up and down by one. Remember, what about statements like branch EQ, right? Um, in our 3090 assembly, if you haven't seen the project spec yet, um, again, this is just kind of like um, doing a calculation and jumping, right? Based on the result of that calculation. Same sort of stuff here. We compare two registers and we jump to a certain location um, if the registers are equal, and if not, we don't. So we're going to need a way to not just go up by one, but um, perhaps handle a jump of an arbitrary size using our assembly. So let's not get too confused with all of it right now. We are just outlining specifications, but I think we have kind of pondered what exactly we want enough. So let's think of our goals in terms of very simple um, terms, what we've got so far and what we are going to be needing. So what have we got? We currently have an excellent ROM architecture that takes in a binary number as a signal and produces the corresponding line of code. Excellent. That is what we have right now. And that is, you know, hopefully there's no dispute there. That's what we talked about last week. That's what we should have at this current juncture, right? Now here's our job. We need a circuit that produces line numbers in binary. That's it. Um, that's really what we need, right? And it needs to work sequentially. Again, I've got a little example here. Produce one, then two, then three, over and over. And also, we need to be able to handle that one little bit, right? We need to be able to increment and decrement by arbitrary quantities. In other words, if we're talking purely about assembly, right, we need to be able to jump from one line to another. For example, if we were at line number two and we ran into a branch EQ or a branch something else, right, um, we need to be able to handle jumping from perhaps line two to five um, if the branch, uh, branch statement specifies that, right? Again, this could be handled simply by incrementing our program counter register by three. So hopefully it's become somewhat... Um, apparent at this point that we need some sort of variable, some sort of register, right, that will store what exactly the line is that we're at, right? Um, so hopefully it's kind of making sense. And here's a neat little diagram of um, what we'll be kind of working through, right? Here's the deal. Here's um, where a circuit will belong among our other planned components. Right now, we're working on the orange one, right? So here's the deal. We built the screen already. We built the ROM. Good stuff. Now we are in the process of writing the program counter. And what that will do is it'll spit out a line number for us that'll go into the ROM, right? And again, our beautiful decoder circuit will take care of going to the ROM and using that number, that line number, um, in order to produce some code, which will get sent straight to the circuitry to, circuitry to interpret it, which will interact with the registers and produce results, right? So don't worry about this business on the left here. We will talk about this next lecture. I just want everybody to think about the program counter aspect of it right now. Remember, we've built a way to store the code that we wrote. Now we need a reliable way to retrieve it um, sequentially, you know, one by one, and we need to be able to handle jump statements. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause it here. Does anybody have any questions about this diagram, the nature of what we're building, anything like that?
solid art. And again, feel free to ask questions at any time. Um, but that's what we've got, right? So now we're going to build the program counter. Now we know exactly what we want to build. So let's brainstorm how we'd put something like this together, right? And um, just like we did last week, I, I want to emphasize that, you know, we know that we have all the conceptual knowledge that we need to get this done. Now, you all have, have sat through a bunch of these lectures. You, you understand a few of these concepts. And I want to emphasize that we actually know plenty um, and we know everything that we need to know uh, in order to build something like this, say for maybe a few facts, right? So the question then becomes, how can we leverage the circuits we already know in order to make a quote unquote counting circuit? And you notice how I say counting circuit, right? Hopefully that should kind of ring a few bells for you because remember we want to go from zero to one to two. Uh, does anyone want to throw a circuit out there for me that might be helpful in our quest? Just kind of throw it in like, I don't know, maybe like lecture questions or something. Take a guess, right? And feel free if you want, it's kind of like an exercise in solid excellent that is one excellent point of view there the clock is an excellent answer in fact there is even one more that i feel like may come to mind bunch of yeah absolutely <laughs> you got it yeah i don't know solid that is just two parts of it right there already totally already filled up right and one more, how would we actually kind of go back and inc increment this number, right? By any arbitrary value. How would we go 0, 1, 2, and then maybe hop over to 5? And I feel like this is the simplest out of the, the, the three answers that I'm looking for. So perfect, you, you two nailed the hard ones. Solid. No, ex excellent point, excellent point, right? Uh, I guess the, the one I'm looking for is even simpler than that, so no worries. Uh, yes, yes, exactly, adder, yep. But those are all excellent components, and just like that, I I mean, that's it, right? You all, you, you two basically kind of just outlined exactly how we're building it, right? So that's awesome to see everybody thinking like that. Um, but that's basically it, right? We'd like a clock to pulse at a regular interval, right? So we can go line by line. Uh, we'd like a bunch of D flip flops to hold a number, and I'm so glad Brian brought this up because we are going to talk a lot more about that next lecture. But we also need a way to persistently keep track of the line number that we're at, right? And our ROM can't do that, so we're going to have to design some special memory for that. Um, and of course, an adder, because we don't just want to go up by one each time. We want to be able to go up by a um, arbitrary amount, right? So we're going to need a whole ass adder to do something like that. Um, and again, we also want to be able to subtract by a, an arbitrary amount sometimes as well, right? So, you know, great stuff to think about. Awesome. So again, these are the concepts that we've learned about so far. And the ones that I kind of threw out there were, okay, the ones that would be useful, right? And again, we, we already just talked about this, um, are these, right? We've got latches to store a number. We've got an adder. And of course, decoder is an excellent point to kind of think about. In this particular case, though, since we are dealing with just storing the number in the latches, uh, the D flip flops, wouldn't you agree that it would be totally fine to store that in binary within the flip flops and then just throw them into the adder when we need? So in this case, in this case, I don't even think we would even you know need to bother with the decoder because we don't ever need to interface between binary and uh, and decimal. Um, but yeah, awesome, solid stuff. Now, it turns out, in order to implement our program counter. All we really need, right? All we really need is a clever combo of an adder and latches and flip-flops, right? So in other words, we need an adder and we need memory, which kind of makes sense. Like think about this mullet over in your head, right? We need memory to store what line we're on. We need an adder to keep adding to it, right? And a clock is an excellent point. I'm so glad you brought that up, Miguel. I might put that in the slides next semester because that's just another key point. Um, in why we need something like this, right? I know we already talked about a clock, but look, now that we figured out a way to um, store a number, right? we'll just keep them in latches, right? And we have an idea of how we'd increment to it using an adder. Now we need to keep doing that on a routine basis, you know, one and one over and over and over, right? Move through the program routinely. How would we do that? Obviously a clock, right? So the clock and the program counter are linked in this very intimate way. And uh, I hope we understand why that is. 
Um, so I'll take this moment again. Does anybody have any questions as to, um, you know, what really the program counter is? I'll take this moment to say, I mean, if you've worked through like 216, right? Hopefully you've seen the program counter register before. We're building that in a very real and low level sense. Cool, cool. Again, feel free to, to hop in and stop me anytime uh, if this is confusing. Um, but that's essentially what we're doing, right? We're just building that program kind of register and we know everything we need to know to build it. So first and foremost, we need to keep track of what line we want to be pulling from. In other words, we need to store a value containing the value of the current line so we can feed this value back into the ROM, right? Again, remember, the ROM circuit that we talked about building last week requires a binary input, right? That binary input is the line number that we're at. If we can just take the line number that we're at and get it stored in perhaps a few latches, right, then we're home free. All we need to do is read the, um, the uh, output value, right, the set value of those latches, um, and that'll tell us what number is stored in those latches, right? So hopefully that kind of makes sense. I mean, don't worry, we'll kind of talk a little bit about how we'll use latches again, um, you know, moving forward in the slides, but that should really do it, right? So if you think back to the memory lecture, you'll know there is an obvious choice. And again, awesome, I'm so glad we kind of got to the, the latches idea, but hopefully that makes sense, right? Because remember, the only circuit that we know, the only circuit that we know that can keep track of, you know, memory values and change them on the fly, right, are those latches because we can't use the torches to do something like this. The reason being, we need to manually edit the torches should we wish to change a certain value in memory. However, if we use latches, we can go ahead and use an adder perhaps to increment the binary numbers stored in these latches. And again, this might sort of um, augment our understanding of why we just need, we'd like to have binary everywhere in our circuits because I hope by this point it's become kind of apparent that um, Many of these circuits, um, whether it be the input that they need or the output that they produce, they're kind of optimized to create this um, in binary, right? So again, our latches are just so well specced to um, produce these these values in binary, right? Um, and again, our ROM circuit, the one that's decoding the line number and producing our code back, right? Um, that also is perfectly specced to take in binary, right? So again. We'll store everything in binary, and since it's so easily usable in all of these digital logic circuits, um, probably better not to, you know, decode or encode this back to decimal, um, unless we're really, unless really we're interfacing um, with uh, either a set of commands, right? So when we talked about, we, I'm, I think you all have built that with the ALU, um, or we're making some human readable output, right? So again, that's what we're looking at. If you think back to the memory lecture, you know, you'll know that there is an obvious choice for us in terms of storing memory in our circuits, right? And that is the latch. So you may be tempted to recall and think that, okay, hey, latches can only store a single bit that's worth of, like, you know, of state, right? One or zero. So you might be wondering, okay, why in the world would we need, um, like, latches to store a binary number? Well, remember... Our ROM, again, needs input in binary. So thanks to the ROM's binary requirement, our solution can be just as simple as storing three latches worth of data. Recall that even though latches can only store the value one or zero reliably, we could just put a bunch of these latches together and have them store as one or zero each. Um, and when we do that, we are effectively storing a binary number. So does that make sense to everybody? Again, just pop in if you have a question about that. Cool, okay, but that's essentially the deal there, right? If we have multiple latches together, that allows us to store a binary number reliably, which is exactly what we want. Um, so that way, when it's needed, we can just send the value of these three latches down to the ROM in order to request a line, right? So we are very well positioned here. Now, using perhaps like three latches, right? We can store comfortably, again, if you, let, let's think about it, right? How many line numbers, can, can somebody tell me how many line numbers could you possibly store? Or what is the line number that you could get all the way up to if you had three latches worth of data storing your program counter? Absolutely solid. In, in fact, um, let's consider line zero as well. So, yeah, no, exactly, yeah, um, 
yep yep no exactly yep so both answers are i just realized i asked like what's the maximum number um so both answers are yeah exactly um eight total right we'll, we'll start at zero and we'll go zero one two three four five six seven and at that point our program counter would overflow or or um flip back over to zero right um which is excellent because um that's kind of exactly what we we want we want to be able to get a program counter um expandable in a very easy fashion so if we ever need to go past seven lines you know no problem just throw another latch on there right um and then uh, would overflow be good or undefined behavior? Um, we probably do not want to reach uh, overflow in this case, right? And the easiest way to handle that is just say, if we've reached the, the final binary number, we'll just, we'll just exit out, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, in this case, um, yeah, no overflow would be undefined behavior. So usually things like this, um, we'll have loop constructs sitting around in there that'll just jump us back to a certain point in the middle um, and repeat a few lines. Uh, so it won't just be only eight instructions total always running, right? Remember, we perhaps have loops that'll hop us back. We have um, decisions that'll maybe make us skip a few lines. Um, and usually it's a lot more than eight <laughs> um, lines of code. And you'll, you'll kind of see this in the project, right? Um, you'll have the option to add more and more lines if you really need. Um, I think we we prescribe I think like four worth of um worth of code. Um, so hopefully that makes sense to everybody, right? We store the value in these three latches, and um, now that these three latches are keeping track of a number for us, right? In binary, um, we're all good. We can just request the um the actual set value of these latches whenever we need the line that we're at. Okay, so now I think we can all agree that we have an excellent way of storing the line number that we are actually at right now and here's the hard part actually incrementing it right because i mean come on we know latches already this this should be kind of this should make sense we got this you know now let's figure out how we you know increment then and, and decrement so we figured out how to store a number how would we move it around right and i just want to default back to adders because that is exactly what we need right think of it this way right now we're storing a binary number and all I'm asking us to do is either add one to that binary number um, and give us back an output in binary, right? Or maybe subtract a few, add a few. Um, and the way I think about it is, you know, these adders, uh, that's exactly what, what they can produce, right? Not only can they re reliably add um, not just one, but arbitrary quantities to a binary number, they also very neatly produce output of the result in binary. And what's to say we can't just feed that result from the adder right back into our latches, right? So if our latches are saying, hey, currently you are at line number two, then we reach a perhaps a, a branch statement that says, hey, send us down to line number seven, right? So the um, program counter would say, hey, we're at line number two feed that into the, the adder, and um, if we ran into a line that said, hey, take us up to a line seven, the adder would say, okay, no problem. Let me take two, the two that we had in the latches, add five that you told me to jump by, and the answer, seven, would get sent straight back into the program counter, right? So that is that is essentially, on a very like low instructional level, how a jump would occur, right? Um, and that's why adders are such an excellent choice for this reason, right? The solution is so elegant. We don't need to com convert between um, binary and decimal uh, because everybody talks in binary. Um, all these circuits are totally fine dealing with binary. Um, and that's why we can, you know, add and subtract. In other words, all this logic, right, of this, this operation, you've already taken care of it. You've built circuits that do this, right? So why not just leverage the circuits that you've built um, in order to do this exact thing? Right, so that is that is exactly what we need to be doing. And um, again, I don't want to make any confusion. Again, you don't want to use the one that's just like wired up to your ALU already. Um, you don't want to clutter that up um, or add some more, you know, mess to your ALU. So this program counter, you'll want to be building like a separate adder uh, again outside of um, the ALU construct, right? So um, I guess don't let that confuse you. Don't don't like double use your um, ALU for the program counter. You'll find that it gets a little messy. Um, so think about it this way, right? That being said, what do we intend to do regarding the ROM at the start of every cycle, right? Um, and, and, you know, let's think about the answer to that question. It's kind of like a rhetorical one, right? Um, a very simple answer for this one. 
uh, just to get us thinking, right? The answer to this is we intend to add one to the program counter each and every time, right? And I think we should start with that instruction because that's the simplest way to uh, begin with how we'd be implementing a program counter, right? So you might be tempted to ask, aren't there simpler ways of adding one to our number stored in memory, right? We could just see what's going on and maybe flip a bit um, somewhere in the middle or flip, a, you know, using conditional logic, just flip a bit somewhere. Um, and there are, there are very simple ways to just throw one to a number, right? You could use some logic gate magic and go ahead and slap like a one um, reliably on there. This would be even easier given that we only have like a maximum value for a program counter. So if we only had like four latches, right? Um, it would be very easy to definitively figure out how to just add one to it, right? But remember, we're not just adding one to it, right? We got to break away from that idea. A program counter is a versatile variable that will keep track of any point in the program that we're at. Um, and it needs to be able to hop backwards and hop forwards. That being said, certainly, there are very easy ways to do something like that, right? But we don't just want to be able to add one, right? We want to be able to do a lot more than that. Again, keep going back to that example of branch and jump, but I feel like that's the um, that's the real way, you know, to kind of think about this sort of stuff, right? Again, this is the branch EQ statement. I know it's been a minute since we've taken 2.16 um, for most of us, and 2.16 doesn't cover assembly language until next week, or maybe Thursday. Um, yeah, next week. Um, but the above is called a branch statement, so we'll just kind of go a little bit over it. Um, and let's examine its core functionality, right? Again, the project spec um, that Ashwath has put together has an excellent kind of documentation of um, the assembly functionality that um, we're going to be building in. Um, but all it's really asking us to do, right, in a sense, is, hey, based on the result of whatever is at this line, right, I want you to increment or decrement the program counter by an arbitrary amount, right? Um, so in order to support this functionality, all we're going to do is leverage an adder, again, with a built-in subtract flag. And this is great because you all actually already know how to build a subtractor, right? Um, we talked about this. Totally fine. We have the knowledge to do something like this. Now let's go ahead and apply this knowledge in order to actually build a program code. And I feel like this is an excellent sort of application of what we learned because previously, like I said, the last few projects have been making us put together this sort of calculator, right? Um, you know, you give it an operation to do, it'll take some numbers, do some fancy business, and spit out, you know, um, the result, right? But now what we're doing um, in this, this back half of the semester is really taking the knowledge of the constructs that we built, right, these basic circuits, and we're saying, hey, let's build some very low-level computer architecture leveraging the circuits that we already know. Uh, and I think that's beautiful. I think that building the skills to kind of right, answer these questions like, hey, here's the functionality we need what are the ways that we can build it using the circuits that we already know? Keeping track of things like this, of that sort of rationale and reasoning, I think that is what makes um, an excellent sort of judgment come out of you as a, as, you know, perhaps a computer engineer or a computer scientist, right? Um, so that being said, all we're going to do here is leverage an adder with a built-in subtract flag to take over, to take care of all of this functionality, right? And, and really, that's what being a computer scientist is all about, using the tools afforded to you um, by what you've learned in order to accomplish a task in the most efficient way possible, right? And that's exactly what we're doing um, in this particular case. Right on. So hopefully everybody understands the brand CQ statement. Um, take a second here if anybody has any questions about it and why I keep ragging on and on about the um, increment and decrement functionality. Everybody all good with this? Solid, okay. Now all we need to do is combine the two in a meaningful way. Again, the two that I'm talking about are the latch and the adder, right? Or the set of latches and the adder. So let's use the latch setup to store our program counter variable and let's hook up an adder to it in order to allow us to add and subtract arbitrary amounts, right? And again, you might be understanding the idea of the latches, right? Those are storing our numbers and the adder, which can add to our numbers. But I just want to kind of go over how you'd mush them both together, how you would connect the two, right, efficiently in order to get this done. Um, and again, that's, that's the kind of the whole gist of the project here, the program counter, but let's talk about it, right? So first of all, um, or actually, that that is right before we do that. There's a little um aside that I want to go over, and there is there are other ways to do this. Actually, <laughs> you can use latches, right, um, to also build a counter, right. 
by chaining them together, there's actually a really neat way. And I just wanted to throw this in there because, again, this is, I mean, we're kind of talking a little bit about computer architecture, but we're using an adder to do something like this, right? Um, and a program counter variable. Um, but here's a neat way to actually just go counting, right? Um, uh, by chaining a bunch of latches together, we can pulse them separately and increment the total binary number up one by one, right? I know this is somewhat of an aside, and again, this is not what we're doing, but it's called a, the construct itself is called a ripple counter. Um, we're not gonna be building something like this, but I thought it was just really interesting to include because, um, you know, we might as well talk about multiple ways that we have just to like, you know, increment through perhaps a set of instructions that we've got um, or anything else, honestly. So I just wanted to show a quick demo oh, of the ripple counter. Okay, this is actually really fast. Uh, um, check it out. So we've got one here as our output, right? Or, okay, this is really slow now. Um, but check it out. If we, any second now, really, it's just gonna, it's gonna pulse. <laughs> uh, we can expect it. There we go. Okay, that was very fast. But I, I hope you saw that, right? When we pulsed um, the circuit, right? And you'll notice that this clock is now off. Um, let's let's go a little faster so we can kind of see what exactly is going on here. Uh, okay, I know at some point it just becomes unbearably fast, so I'm trying to get it decent for everybody. Um, great, awesome, okay, okay, yeah. So you see that we've, by incrementing this clock over and over, right, you can see that with a series of latches, um, and I know it's going kind of fast, but we're actually going up and incrementing binary numbers perfectly fine. So again, remember when I was talking about adding one to a circuit very easily, right? Um, if you just wanted to keep adding one, you could do something like this, right? You could just pulse a set of chained latches with an adder, um, and you'd have a pretty reliable way, a pretty, li bleh, a pretty reliable way of just going up one by one. Um, so this is a perfectly neat way to do something like this. Um, and I just kind of wanted to bring it to everybody's attention. I think it's a cool way to kind of think about how latches work and how we can leverage them to, to do neat things, right? Um, and again, remember, these are latches, so they'll have the little control input here. Um, and only when the control input is on will the latch change state, right? So just a little bit of an aside there. I will now stop this and... Uh, excellent. Okay. Go back here all the way down to R. Current slide, boop, 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 verbal counters. Okay, um, and that's the deal there, right? So again, remember when I was talking about a very easy way to kind of increment them one by one, that is a way to do it, right? Totally valid, but not what we are looking for here. So the overview and nuances, and again, right, so I, I know I kind of left us here, right? Um, this bit, this whole dealio, right? That is kind of what our project is about, right? We have the tools afforded to us, now we need an efficient way to put these together, right? And that's kind of where the, the reasoning and logic comes in for putting this project together. And again, we've got demos and stuff floating around. Um, we'll kind of look a little bit into that, but that's that's kind of the, the real gist of this project, right? So, oh, what did I do? Ah, okay. Key takeaways. The program counter is how we tell which line we're at, right? And again, this is a register, but let's just think of it as a bunch of latches mushed together. Um, and we need to output this line in binary for the ROM to be able to give us that line exactly, right? Um, so the fun fact here is that there's, again, literally a register in many assembly implementations that stores this value, and it's usually called the program counter. And I know with, with Larry's um, computer project, he like, or the Mathlon project, he literally kind of shows you that exact um, program counter and you have to interact with it. So same deal here, right? We are just incrementing a program counter and changing it based on what line we want to be at. Um, so again, if you did Larry's Mathlon or Coffee Cake project or whatever, um, this is exactly what we're doing. We are building the hardware representation of that, right? Um, again, using just latches to store that value and an adder to increment and decrement that value, right? And just like that, we will be able to store what line we're at and we'll be able to increment by one every cycle um, or um, if we choose to, by some other arbitrary value um, for every cycle, right? And this is where that clock comes in, right? I'm so glad that we talked about the clock earlier because that is exactly um, what we need to be doing, right? We need that clock to reliably pulse our adders and say, hey, all right, it's been a, a cycle, right? Let's go to the next line. 
Um, and that's how we'll kind of get to it, right? We'll sequentially hit, um, keep adding one, one, one. We hit a, a brand statement that tells us to go by five. We'll say, okay, we'll add five this time, right? But that's really what keeps us going. The ticking that keeps us going is that clock that repeatedly pulses us and tells us, hey, time to uh, add another one to the uh, the set of latches that represents our program counter, right? So hopefully putting those three constructs together, the clock, the latches, and the adder will help us understand um, really how to build a program counter. I mean, really, it's that easy, right? We just need to store the value. We need to add to it over and over. And um, we also need to uh, have a circuit that reliably pulses us, right? So that we can keep adding to it over and over. Um, so that's what that is. And I know we, we did have like an idea for a demo, right? Um, and I know I talked about this last year. I don't know if we'll have time for it this time, just because we're reaching the end here. And I know we're a little behind. So I was actually planning on maybe doing this next lecture. So no worries on that, because I know we are like a little bit off on schedule for this. So I think it'll be a lot more relevant if we do the demo next lecture. For now, please start thinking about this, right? Um, how we'd kind of build something like this. And maybe we'll we'll kind of go through a demo next lecture when our projects kind of line up and we, we catch up to this. Um, so again, don't want to overload you with information. So don't worry, we will go over like a little demo of this uh, next lecture. All right, but I do want you all to think about building this in Minecraft, right? We're essentially looking at building an adder retrofitted with latches and locking mechanisms, right? This is important. We'll talk a little bit more about this next week um, to facilitate storage of a value, right? Um, and I have a demo in Minecraft that I've color coded. I will kind of walk us through it perhaps next week. It should give you a much better understanding of what we're looking to build. Um, but keep in mind, in our Minecraft implementation, right, latches and adders um, are a little entangled, right? They're a little bit weirder to build um, than just drawing out the digital logic circuits, but no worries, right? We're still looking to accomplish the same basic tasks and Minecraft affords us this capability. So no worries about the demo. We will talk about that next week, uh, mainly because, you know, we just, I think it's good to let the project deadlines catch up with them, what we're actually doing in class. Um, but yeah, I will take this moment to take questions. Um, but yes, Ashwat, do you have anything to add, by the way? Uh, no, not really. Um, I can try and put out a video of like a demo of this, just so people have the understanding. Oh, that would be awesome. Yes, if you got the time. But yeah, other than that, uh, that's all I had. Awesome. All right. Cool. I would say this is the um one of the simpler parts of the last three projects. I know I kind of went on a long spiel about it, but when it comes to building it, um, you kind of know everything you need to know and it's, it's not super tedious at all. So I think y'all got it. Cool. That's all the instruction we've got for today. So thanks so much for coming. Um, and feel free to kind of dip off here. I will also probably go to bed. I'm going to move to the Office Hours channel. So if anyone uh, has or needs help with Project 5, uh, feel free to move in there. Awesome. And I'll stick around here for like five minutes for any administrative questions or something. All right.